grades that was slightly concerning. So the average was 58-ish, but then the standard deviation was 17 and a half. So, huh? No, 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 out of 80. So 57 out of 80, and then 17 and a half points out of 80 for standard deviation. So there was a very wide distribution of grades. Um, the high score was an 84, so congrats to whoever ended up with that. But then there was, there was a lot at the tail that also made me concerned that, I, that we weren't doing enough uh, to connect the lecture concepts to, to problems. So um, what I wanted to see, so I, I can, take, I can uh, take this one of two ways right now. I was thinking about going through the midterm and, and talking about some of the problems that were more challenging or that we saw had a lot more mixed results on, or I could just dive straight into lecture. Um, what would you all prefer? Can you recap the midterm? Yeah. Like you said? Yeah, yeah. So is that, so I, I'll, I'll basically just go through some of the problems, maybe 15, 20 minutes, talk through um, problems that were particularly challenging. Is that something that people are good with? Or would you rather just dive straight into lecture? Midterm? Okay. So, let's talk about the midterm then. And I think in the future I'll also be trying to do this with homeworks. Um, so, homework three and four are still being graded right now. And we'll get those back to you, but um, I guess those are on previous concepts. So it's maybe not as relevant for, there we go, cool. It's maybe not as relevant for the rest of the material. Oh, there we go. So I'll also post this online later, uh, but I wanted to talk through it a little bit now. So uh, eight or nine, eight questions and a bonus question on the midterm. Uh, I think this first one was one of the ones that kind of threw people for a loop. It was the one that I considered to be a, a little tricky extension of concepts, but really it was trying to get you to apply some of these stiffness relationships. Yeah? Uh, I did that, and then I crossed it out and did something else. Because so this is 45, makes the bulk modulus infinite, and it says it wants the bulk modulus to be finite. It does, but. So, what, how does that mean? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's because in and if there, there's no such thing as an infinite bulk modulus, so it's approach new is approaching 0.5 for a pentamode material, effectively. So, yeah, it's if you had it and scratched it out on your midterm, come talk to me and we can we can see about it. We may have actually given you points for that. So I, we graded this all, me and the TAs, last Friday. Um, I, and I don't, I wasn't the one to grade problem one, but we can talk through it if you have concerns. Um, I also, I'll hand them all out, or you can pick them all up at the end of class. So, so this was trying to get you to apply these um, elasticity relationships back into this. So K, K is finite, meaning your shear modulus is zero, which is the same for water, so water can't, or a fluid can't hold any shear, or can't hold any elastic or uniaxial stress, it can only hold the bulk pressure. Um, and it's never perfectly incompressible, which would be a bulk modulus of infinity, which is why I clarified that the, the bulk modulus was finite. But yeah, I, I can see how that might have been a little bit strange there. Um, and pentamode materials are real things too. So this is an actual metamaterial. Uh, this is something that uh, not my group works on, but groups related work on. And so effect effectively the way you get this with a metamaterial is by creating cones that are connected to a tiny pin. And so that pin makes it so that it's really easy to deform, but then because of the way it's structured, it can hold the bulk pressure. Um, and what they use this for is acoustic cloaking. So you can actually make a, an acoustic invisibility cloak, meaning if there's a wave, like a pressure wave, the pressure wave can go around an object inside of it. Um, similar to optical invisibility, but with 
pressure waves instead of optical waves, which is why I thought it was kind of a fun question, but might have been a little bit strange for the midterm. There we go. Uh, cool. Uh, feel free to stop me if there's extra questions or concerns as we're going through these. So two was an application of uh, Hooke's Law in 3D. So you could either have used the Hooke's Law's equations or the matrix representation of Hooke's Law. You should have gotten something out like this, either in terms of G and lambda or um, E and nu. When you got that, uh, if Poisson's ratio went to zero, you get that the, the stress in the Z direction goes to zero, um, which basically means that if you don't have a Poisson's ratio, so um, if you remember, we did an example in class where when you pull on a material biaxially, the, that through direction, uh, that Poisson's ratio creates a resistance to that, and you're effectively getting twice the, um, uh, or one and a half times the resistance to stretching due to that Poisson's ratio effect. And if you don't have a Poisson's ratio, then you just, it's effectively uniaxial stress in both directions and they don't interact. Um, which I didn't necessarily expect to come through in the exam, but um, that was why this was a somewhat interesting problem. Um, yeah. The, but I, I think this one was mostly fine. Three was also, I think, mostly fine. We, we gave credit for Drucker, Prager, more, more Coulomb, max normal stress. Um, it was really looking to see if that you knew how to draw a yield surface and that something inside, uh, or if the stress was inside the yield surface, it survived. Um, so we were expecting to see something like that, but we were a little bit flexible with giving credit. Um, this one, so why does brittle fail, or why does a brittle, why does chalk fail at a 45 degree angle? Why does a uniaxial tension fail by necking? And both of those are the same concept, but applied differently. So torsion, which we'll be doing this week um, experimentally, you're applying a state of pure shear. And so when you apply that state of pure shear, the maximum resolved tension is along a 45 degree angle, uh, which I think I talked about in the, in the midterm review a bit. Um, so that 45 degree angle is what's gonna cause tensile failure. Uh, necking happens also because you have shear at a 45 degree angle. So both of these are failures happening at a 45 degree angle relative to the thing. Um, and so it's either shearing, shear failure in ductile materials or tension failure in a brittle material. But all of it's about resolved shear or resolved, uh, resolved, resolved maximum shear or resolved maximum tension. Um, and so I think this one was, was fairly mixed, which I thought I had done enough in like, a couple examples on it in class, but I guess it still hadn't quite come through. Um, yeah. The principal stresses, there was a few different ways to calculate this. The, so there was the Moore circle equation here. You can use, you could have used eigenvalue analysis, which I think a few people did. Um, you should have gotten something like that. As long as you set the problem up, we should have given you some partial credit. Um, principal stresses, so once you have, or principal stress directions, once you have those principal stresses, you can figure out what direction they're in. There was a, an equation there, I think this was one half inverse tangent of two tau over sigma x minus sigma y. This one, actually, I'd, I'd like people to check when you get your midterm back, because, so I think there were some inconsistencies in the grading from the TA based on how you were defining things. So the, here the x direction was defined along the axis of the cylinder and the maximum stress, maximum stress one was oriented kind of this way, uh, 20 degrees relative to that vertical direction. Uh, and I think there are probably more people that should get partial credit there than actually did, but it's because some of it was difficult to understand um, what direction you were referring to or what direction you were taking things relative to in the exam. So double check this one uh, when you get your exam back in particular. But yeah, it's that 26 degrees and then the, the, that the second one is 90 degrees relative to that. Uh, seven, this was a, another application of Hooke's Law in 3D, or not even Hooke's Law in 3D, I guess because there was no 
stress in the y direction. I think the biggest mistake here was people using principal stresses here instead of the instead of the stresses here, which uh, I think was a minor confusion point. We didn't knock off too much for that, just a few points for uh, for using the wrong values, but as long as you had the right equations, it should be fine. And then knowing that uh, torque doesn't affect shear stress. I think there was also some confusion about what axial strain was. It probably, we probably could have been a little bit more explicit with that, that we were looking for EZZ, but we only marked off one or two points if you if you chose other uh, shear <coughs> values there. Uh, yield criteria, it's recognizing that you're looking for the maximum principal stress as your equivalent stress because it's a brittle material and then just plugging it into this factor of safety equation. Then um, the if the material is br brittle, this is knowing that brittle materials fail in tension and specifically the failure plane is orthogonal to the direction of maximum tensile stress. So I think that one, lots of people ended up with like two or three points on that uh, for saying brittle materials fail in tension or uh, something about the, the maximum direction. But a lot of people had that, the plane was oriented along that 26 degree instead of orthogonal to that 26 degree angle. And that was the biggest point of confusion there. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, there was, I, I think there was a lot more of a disconnect between, again, between the lectures and what was what was expected in the exam. And I'll, I'll be trying to fix that through some more uh, numerical examples in the lectures and in homework sets. Yeah, so you'll be able to look at them. Um, I'll have office hours, the TAs will have office hours. If you feel like there's something you were graded incorrectly on in the exam, just come to us come talk to us. Um, if you have a disagreement with the TAs, just come talk to me and I'll, I, I'll talk it through. But the TAs should also know um, what, what should be getting and shouldn't be getting credit. Cool. Questions about the midterm or concerns or general thoughts on any of the problems or anything in here? Cool. How did you all feel about the midterm? <laughs> uh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So we'll 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 do a better job, or we'll try to give you more opportunities to to do problems more similar to what will be on the final um, for the future. Uh, Okay, cool. Let's talk about material now. So, maybe, there it is. Cool. All right, I forgot to get an erasable pen again. Uh, I feel like there was something else that I wanted to say before we got started, but maybe it'll come to me. All right. So uh, this week will be the oh right. So for the midterm, just as a as a side note, remember this is only fifteen percent of your grade. The the labs are the much more a much more significant portion of the grade. So doing poorly on the midterm is not a, a deal breaker or a grade ender. Um, what's much more important is that you you continue to do well in the labs, which I guess the first tension labs are today. Uh, tension labs are due today and then for the rest of the week. So uh, this week we'll be working on torsion. So this this lab deals with plasticity. So that'll it'll be um, on some of the concepts we had been talking about for the last couple of weeks, um, or I guess not last week, but the week before that and a little bit before that. So specifically it'll be looking at torsion testing. Cool. So with torsion, 
we had talked about it really briefly uh, last week, but I wanted to go through it in more detail now. So the reason we do torsion tests is because it's one of the few tests where you can apply a state of near pure shear. So if I apply a torque, I have some rod, um, and I'm going to look now at the change in angle uh, if I apply some torque T to some rod of length L with some radius R, uh, I'm going to have now a twist <coughs> angle theta, and I and I want to relate this applied torque and this applied twist angle to my shear and uh, to my shear strain and shear stress. So before we had shown. Uh, just the relationship for shear strain. I wanted to go through that in a little bit more detail because I think it was somewhat confusing. But uh, here, basically, if we if we take an infinitesimal block on the surface of this rod, we're applying what is basically a state of pure <coughs> shear to this material with some shear tau. This is one of the few tests where you can actually get a state of pure shear with the other two being an Iosipescu and a V-notch shear test, which actually I'd like to show you because they're a little bit more relevant to actual industrial scale testing, but we won't be doing them in this class because there's a little bit more interesting analysis with this. Can you explain what plane that um, the little like, strain square was on, the stress square? Like, where does it sit inside? That? Uh, it's vertical, but let, let me come back to it. Okay. Let me just show these first and then we'll jump back. So uh, there's, there's two types of tests, cool, that are, oh, <laughs> that's, some, that's some chill beats from, <laughs> from an ASTM test. Cool. Um, it was All right. Cool. So this is an Iosipescu testing setup. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it off. That's too distracting. <laughs> <laughs> this is an Iosipescu setup. So you can see that there's two blocks here that you put a sample between. These two blocks are separate, so there's nothing connecting them. You have one side that's grounded to the floor, and then one side on a sliding peg that can be pushed up and down. So there we go. So you see this part can slide up and down freely, this side is grounded. And so what you do is you take a, a rod sample and you put a, a notch in the side. This is our strain gauges, which you should now be familiar with. Uh, and this is on a carbon fiber sample, not that that particularly matters, but this is one way of getting uh, a nice state of uniform shear in a material. So you would load this up, you would get some state of roughly pure shear in the center, and you would be trying to correlate that with um, the, the axial response, the shear response of the material. So this is now that same test done using digital image correlation, which will be the last lab for the class. So you'll actually get to do something like this except with a hole in a plate. Um, and with this digital image correlation, you can actually find out what the stresses or what the strains are in the material and correlate that with the stresses in the material. So this is now you can see at that notch you're developing a state of almost pure shear here in the middle between those two, um, which is a difficult which is difficult to do with any other test really. So the one the one other test that's actually useful for that, so you can now see that part deforming. The one use other useful test that's somewhat similar is a V notch rail test, where it's the same idea. This is now a butterfly specimen instead. So again, strain gauges in the middle. Uh, you have two have two parts that are separated, and you clamp uh, the materials on one side of the other. Clamp the materials on one side of the other. Clamp it in the grips. Apply a pre-torque. This is again a carbon fiber specimen. Cool. You can see failure surfaces for carbon fiber, which uh, we're not going to be doing that for this class because carbon fiber, but. Uh, now this is again a DIC test where you can see 
the the strain that develops in the gauge section of this. Maybe, eventually. There we go. Cool. So now you can see again a state of almost pure shear here in the center. It's not quite as clean as the Iusopescu test. Um, lots of those concentrations were developing because of failure happening in the carbon fiber, but um, in general this 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 Iusopescu type of test gives you a slightly cleaner shear profile than this uh, V-notch butterfly section. We were thinking about adding this and having this be your other lab for the class, but the I think the analysis for torsion testing is a little bit more interesting. Also, the, the setup is something you can all do yourselves. You just have uh, a kind of a torsion jig that you put samples into. Um, and so the, the analysis for this isn't quite as interesting. It's more straightforward. Uh, it would be a lot easier, but then what's the fun in that? Okay, so back to torsion testing. Right, so now that that section is oriented vertically on this rod. So if I, if I unraveled this sheet, so uh, what I'm basically doing in twisting this thing, so let's take this break it apart there and actually unravel it. What I'm basically doing, or what I'm basically looking at now, when I when I twist this sheet, if I break this apart, um, is I, as I'm shearing it, I'm moving my material over by some, dang it, I need my erasable pen back. Um, as I'm twisting it, I'm rotating this side by some distance r theta here. So I'm, I'm moving this side by an r theta over. And the total height of this is an L. So this is, if I, if I took that sheet and spread it apart from the center point here, So what I what I'm doing in rotating it is is applying this sort of a shear, and the reason we just take now, before I had, I had given you our definition of gamma, uh, gamma equals r theta over l, we get that r theta over l geometrically from this sort of analysis, um, where I'm moving uh, this part from its original distance. I guess this is my r theta here that I'm moving it over uh, and I'm moving it over by some distance to L. Technically we're making a small angle approximation so really if I was looking for dang it this is really got used to being able to erase stuff um, here we go let's draw it this way and make a gamma there so really if I was if I was looking at this I could I would be drawing a triangle some r theta some L there and my uh, tangent of of my gamma would be equal to opposite over adjacent, so r theta over l. Uh, but then, because I'm assuming this is in a small strain regime, I'm gonna take that tan of gamma is approximately equal to gamma in my in my small strain limit, and then I just have gamma equals r theta over l. For at the center of the beam, so you can see I drew this kind of as a as a slice of pie now, a kind of a an oddly shaped slice of pie. At the center of the beam, there's actually no motion. So you can see now because this is an r theta, the further away from my center point, the more motion I'm going to get. And at the neutral axis of my beam, at the center point, there actually is no relative motion. So there is no shear. So you can see that coming in with that r term here. So at the center, this is effectively like the neutral plane of a beam and bending. It's now the neutral plane of a, of a rod and torsion. So I have no shear at the center point, and I have my maximal shear at the outer edge. Cool. So, so there's a slightly better explanation than what I had given last time. So now what I want to do is figure out what my shear stress is in my bar. So. I now, I can say I can figure out shear strain geometrically, I make a small angle approximation, I uh, look at how 
what the motion of the surface is relative to um, relative to the uh, relative to the initial position, and I get some shear out. But I want to figure out how torque relates to uh, my applied load T or my applied torque T. So to do that, now I, I know that my sample isn't moving in the center. I can use my elasticity relationships to say tau equals g gamma, where this is my shear modulus. This is my shear modulus. Uh, so tau equals g gamma or r theta g over l, um, if I wanted to plug that in here. But this still doesn't tell me how this relates to torque. So I know torque is a force times a distance by definition. It's, it's the amount of force I'm applying by how far away that is, by how far away that force is being applied. So what I can do is looking now at the top of my sample, I'm applying some torque T around the outside, and I'm going to draw inside. I'm going to use this handy engineering trick, which is breaking things into parts and taking an integral, which I'm sure you've seen many times before. So I'm going to look at a little ring here in the center of the sample, or in the center of the rod, and I know that along that I have some shear stress acting. I know I can call this rod, or I can say this rod has some area, or some, some uh, width dr, and it's at some distance r away from the center. Cool. So the area of this little annulus, area is 2 pi r dr, which is the area of a, of a thin ring, um, or an infinitesimally small ring. So I can say now the force that's being applied along that, my force is just the shear stress acting times the area, or 2 pi tau r dr. And I know it's acting at some distance d away. So d, my d here is just equal to r in the definition that I'm using here. So now I can I can use that, I can integrate all of, over all those infinitesimal rings, and I can say my torque relates to my shear stress. Torque is now the integral from zero to the outer radius. If this uh, rod has an outer radius, uh, I want to do that r not. So if the if the total radius of this bar is r not, I'm integrating from zero to r not of now my force times my distance, or two pi tau r. Uh, I'm going to pull that d in r squared dr. I can replace now the tau that I got uh, given my shear modulus. So I can say this is also equal to uh, integral from 0 to r naught, 2 pi r theta g over l, r squared dr, or written out, I'm going to pull some things out, 2 pi g theta over l integral from 0 to r naught of r cubed dr. Cool. So this, now, this term here, I'm going to say, I'm going I'm to define a new constant j, which I'm going to take to be my polar moment of area. Polar moment of area, which is going to be equal to the integral of um, r squared dA, generally. Or here for a circle, I already have my um, my 2 pi r uh, counting as one of those uh, dA's. So I have now 2 pi r squared r dr is my area moment of inertia. So this J gets pulled in. Keep using more paper. Cool. 
and I can say now this torque T is equal to G theta over L J. Let me double check to make sure it's right in there. Cool. Where this J is now my pull it. Cool. where this J is my polar moment of area. So similar to the second moment, or area moment of inertia for a beam and bending, now we're just using J instead of I. Um, I can take back and say my tau is equal to R theta G over L. Um, so I have a G theta over L. Now I just need a J R, or a, I guess G theta over L g theta over l is equal to tau over r. So this torque now in terms of my shear is tau j over r. This relationship is a useful one. So this is now in the elastic regime. So I, I'm assuming, let's roll back a tick. So I'm assuming my shear stress is equal to my shear strain in the elastic regime based on that shear modulus. And so I'm using that in my calculation now, um, plugging that elastic shear relationship in, solving for tau. But this formulation, this formulation for <laughs> shear, generally holds for any tau here. So this, I, I happen to plug in the elastic, or the tau in the elastic regime, the, regime, the shear stress in the elastic regime, but what happens once we start plastically yielding this material. So, um, first questions up till there. Okay, so now uh, I guess I'm gonna ask a conceptual question that I don't have a poll everywhere for, um, but what what is the, is the, profile from, uh, what is the shear stress profile, not from, along the radius. This is a lot worse when I can't erase things. Things just look way sloppier. So I had already shown you before This is now, I'm going to call that R. I'm going to say this is my shear stress. What does the shear stress profile look like uh, in ter as a function of R across the sample? And I'm not necessarily going to tell you which. So we have it now in terms of torque and in terms of shear modulus. Is it so? Take a second and talk about it with, or maybe take uh, thirty seconds and talk about it with the people sitting next to you.
Okay. Let's bring it back together. So now, I think in the, the last time we talked about this, I'd shown you the, the shear relationship, or the shear strain relationship from as a function of R is linear, because we have that R theta over G, or uh, sorry, R theta over L, where theta is just an applied twist and L is a fixed length of the beam. So it's a linear function of R. Um, now for our <coughs> torque here, or for our, sh not torque, for our shear stress here, how does that vary as a function of R? Who wants to volunteer what they've been talking about? So Brian, you had already said it's linear. <laughs> Does anyone agree or disagree? Yes. So, because we're taking our shear to be related here to our sh our shear stress to be related to our shear strain, this just varies linearly in the body um, as a function of R. So, in the elastic regime. Now, so this is this is similar or analogous. If you remember the the shear stress for a beam in bending uh, varies linearly across the cross section. Um, I guess here this would technically be like a V if I looked on the other side as well um, of equal magnitude coming across. It's just the same everywhere uh, as a function of radius. But I think you, have a negative radius. you can't. But if you were just to look spatially, so if I were to draw a line across there and define that as a zero point, yeah. Maybe this is making things too confusing. Uh, but so now, what I want to figure out is what happens when this thing starts to go plastic. So for plasticity now, uh, what do you, so I can say that this has some shear stress tau max, which is, I can figure out the tau max from the torque. So I can say my tau max is equal to the torque that I'm applying it's at the outer radius, and it's divided by my area moment of inertia. So, this is a this is an applied value. This is a geometric thing. This is a geometric thing. So the tau max is at that outer surface. What I what I want to figure out now is what happens after that tau max starts to exceed the yield strength of the material. So, um, what I can do is define. Uh, yield stress for the material, or, oh, right, J. Huh. Uh, so J for for a circular beam is pi over 2 R to the fourth. Um, so I don't think I had actually defined that. But, uh, yeah, we could have gotten that from this uh, 2 pi R cubed dr integral. So you would have 2 pi the one fourth, uh, the four would come out. You would have pi over two, r not to the fourth. So, uh, what I now want to see is what happens when tau max uh, starts surpassing the yield strength, equal to greater than or equal to tau yield. So, what starts to happen in for for our profile? Two, two, two is if I have some yield strength tau y now and I hit that yield strength before I get to the out, outer part of the circle I think this is a little bit small if I hit that yield strength before I get to the outer part of the circle then I'll start to plastically deform the outer edge of the specimen so starting at some internal radius which I'm going to call ry which will be my yield radius before I hit my r naught R tau, it'll start plastically deforming. And so then the way that it performs, the way that it behaves after that plastic deformation depends on whether the material is hardening, softening, uh, elastic, perfectly plastic. So this is my shear versus gamma. Um, perfectly 
plastic softening hardening so for most of the materials that you tested or not most of the material the the aluminum and the steel that you tested in lab both of them were hardening uh, which means that uh, as after you pass the yield strength their their stiffness continue or their strength can their stress continued to rise um, monotonically up until they started to neck and then they started to fall off but here in terms of true stress and strain they would they would have continued hardening so now what we can do what I want to figure out is if I apply a certain torque how can I how can I figure out how much how, how that shear stress relates to that applied torque and how how much for a given applied twist how much plasticity there is in the body and how much of that plasticity is contributing to that resistance to continued torque. So uh, what I'm going to do, uh, it's 1017, is I'm going to say my torque, I can break up into an elastic and a plastic component, which now I'm going to use that same integral from before. So the integral from zero to something of uh, 2 pi tau r squared dr except now I'm going to say thanks uh, that I have some torque in the elastic regime up until I hit my yield strength or until I hit my yield strain yield radius there we go uh, and then I have from that r y to r naught 2 pi torque plastic r squared dr so I can take now uh, I can figure out what that yield radius will be if I look back at this maximum shear stress. Uh, I can say my my yield strength is now just when that tau max is tau y j over t. So when the when the torque inside of this nope, uh, but I don't want to use that relationship. Why don't I want to use that relationship? Scratch this one. Sorry. <coughs> Ignore that. So I want to define this in terms of my applied twist instead. Um, so I'm going to have this tau max is T R naught uh, R D R. I'm going to use my gamma yield. So I'm going to say gamma is r theta over L, and my r yield is when I hit my yield strain times my L over theta, which is equal to my tau yield uh, over G L over theta. There we go. So now it's not actually a function of my applied torque. It's a function of the applied twist angle. There we go. That makes more sense. Um, because I don't know what this total, what the individual contributions of elastic and plastic torque are. That makes more sense. Cool. Uh, so now I can say, I can figure out what that yield strain is, and I can plug in some values for into those two. So I know what my yield strain is. I can say now torque is torque elastic plus torque plastic, which is that integral from zero to ry, uh, two pi, my plastic, or my elastic relationship is g theta l, g theta r over l, uh, g theta r over l, over l, really need to get an erasable pen back. Um, r squared dr plus some relationship r y to r naught to pi r squared tau plastic dr and so then the question is what do we use for this tau plastic uh, which it's already 1020 I don't know if I have time to go through so tomorrow I'll finish off the rest of this derivation, and then we'll talk through the torsion lab. Um, I guess really quick, just so you can see it. 
So your torsion test today. There we go. Your, your torsion test today, you'll be taking two specimens, an aluminum and a steel specimen, and you'll be applying a fixed amount of rotation to the body, measuring off a torque. Uh, and recording those values. Yeah. Go for it. Um, we'll talk on email. So, this up my saying the cost ratio of the column fiber is already reduced. Uh, uh, 